The topic of this video is tissue repair, more specifically the differences between regeneration and repair. We're going to look at scar formation, remodeling, what factors influence repair, fibrosis, and abnormalities in repair. So repair, sometimes called healing, refers to the restoration of tissue architecture and function after an injury. Repair of damaged tissue occurs by two types of reactions, regeneration and scarring. Repairing tissue by regeneration requires growth of residual uninjured cells, as well as maturation of tissue stem cells. Some tissues, like the epithelium of the skin or the liver, are able to replace their damaged areas and return to a normal state. But if the injured tissue is incapable of complete regeneration, or if the supporting structures of the tissue are severely damaged, repair occurs by laying down connective fibrous tissue. This is a process that results in scar formation. The scar is not normal, but it provides enough structural stability that the injured tissue is able to function to some degree. The ability of tissues to repair themselves is partially determined by their intrinsic proliferative capacity. Labile tissues or continuously dividing tissues, these cells are constantly being lost and replaced normally through tissue stem cells. Examples of these would be hematopoietic cells in bone marrow, the majority of epithelia like skin, oral mucosa, ducts draining exocrine organs, and the lining of the GI tract. These can readily regenerate after injury as long as the stem cell pool is preserved. Within stable tissues, cells have a minimal proliferative capacity in their normal states. They are capable of dividing in response to injury or loss of tissue mass, and this comprises the parenchyma of most solid tissues like liver or kidneys, but also includes the endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and smooth muscle cells found throughout your body. And with the exception of your liver, stable tissues have a fairly limited ability to regrow. And then permanent tissues, these are terminally differentiated and non-proliferative in postnatal life, things like neurons and cardiac muscle, and that's why injury to these organs is irreversible and typically creates a scar. Now just to reiterate, restoration of normal tissue structure can only occur if the residual tissue is still structurally intact, such as after a partial surgical resection, and if the whole tissue is damaged either by infection or inflammation, regeneration is typically incomplete and accompanied by scarring. Now the liver is a perfect example of repair by regeneration. Regeneration here occurs by two major mechanisms, proliferation of remaining hepatocytes and repopulation from progenitor cells. Following a partial resection, up to about 90% of the liver can be regrown, and proliferation of the residual hepatocytes is triggered by the combined actions of cytokines and growth factors. In situations where this proliferative capacity of the remaining hepatocytes is impaired, such as after chronic liver injury or inflammation, the progenitor cells in the liver will contribute to repopulation. If repair cannot be accomplished by regeneration alone, it will occur by replacement of the injured cells with connective tissue, leading to the formation of a scar, or by a combination of regeneration of some residual cells as well as scar formation. The scarring may happen if the tissue injury is severe or chronic and results in damage to the parenchymal cells and epithelia, as well as to the connective tissue framework, or if non-dividing cells are injured. The term scar is most often used in connection to wound healing in the skin, but it can also be used to describe the replacement of parenchymal cells in any tissue by collagen, like in the heart after a myocardial infarction. There are three primary steps in scar formation, the first of which is angiogenesis, which is the process of new blood vessels developing from existing vessels. It is critical in healing at sites of injury, as well as in the development of collateral circulations at the sites of ischemia, and it also allows tumors to increase in size beyond the constraints of their original blood supply. At sites of injury, the new blood vessels will supply oxygen and nutrients needed to support the repair process. These newly formed vessels are pretty leaky just because of incomplete interendothelial junctions and because VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, this is the growth factor that drives angiogenesis. It also increases vascular permeability. This leakiness accounts in part for the edema that may persist in healing wounds long after the acute inflammatory response has been resolved. A second is the formation of granulation tissue. The link down of connective tissue occurs in two primary steps. The first is the migration and proliferation of fibroblasts into the site of injury. And then secondly is the deposition of ECM proteins produced by these cells. These processes are controlled by locally produced cytokines and growth factors. The main source of these factors are inflammatory cells, specifically the alternatively activated macrophages, which are typically present at sites of injury and within granulation tissue. Transforming growth factor beta, or TGF beta, is the most important cytokine for the synthesis and deposition of connective tissue proteins. It is produced by most of the cells in granulation tissue, including alternatively activated macrophages. As healing progresses, the number of proliferating fibroblasts and new vessels decreases, and there is increased deposition of ECM. 
as this ECM is deposited, collagen synthesis is critical to the development of strength at a wound site. And then ultimately, granulation tissue evolves into a scar composed of largely inactive fibroblasts, dense collagen, fragments of elastic tissue, and a few other ECM components. As this scar matures, there is progressive vascular regression, which eventually transforms the highly vascularized granulation tissue into a pale, avascular scar. Some of the fibroblasts within that tissue also will acquire the feature of smooth muscle cells, including the presence of actin filaments, and become called myofibroblasts, and this helps contribute to the contraction of the scar over time. And then finally, remodeling of the connective tissue. The outcome of the repair process is influenced by balance between synthesis and degradation of ECM proteins. After its deposition, the connective tissue in the scar continues to be modified and remodeled. The degradation of collagens and other ECM components is accomplished by a family of matrix metalloproteinases, or MMPs. During scar formation, these MMPs are activated to remodel the deposited ECM, and then their activity is shut down by nearby tissue inhibitors. There's a variety of factors that will influence the repair process, and these can reduce the rate or quality of healing, and they include things like infection, which can prolong the inflammatory process and increase local tissue injury, diabetes, uh, nutritional status, specifically protein deficiency and vitamin C deficiency. This will inhibit collagen synthesis, and vitamin C is actually required for collagen synthesis. Glucocorticoids, or steroids, these have anti-inflammatory effects and can result in a weaker scar formation due to the inhibition of the TGF-beta production and diminished fibrosis. Mechanical factors, constantly moving or pulling on an injured tissue before it's healed. Poor perfusion, either from atherosclerosis, diabetes, or obstructive venous drainage foreign bodies still within the wound, the type or extent of injury, complete restoration can only occur in stable or labile tissues, injury to permanent cells will result in scarring as well as functional compensation by the remaining tissue, and the location of the injury. Now, as already mentioned, deposition of collagen is a normal part of wound healing, but the term fibrosis is used to denote excess collagen deposition in tissues. Scar and fibrosis are typically used interchangeably, but they are actually different terms. Fibrosis is often used to refer to the abnormal deposition of collagen in internal organs during chronic disease, often due to the persistent stimulation of collagen synthesis. And this is a pathologic process which is associated with a loss of functional tissue, which can lead to organ dysfunction and eventually failure. And similar to the normal process of forming granulation tissue, that transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta, is still the major cytokine seen in fibrosis and cell death either by necrosis or apoptosis, as well as the production of reactive oxygen species seem to trigger the activation of this TGF-beta. Complications in tissue repair can arise from abnormalities in any of the three basic components of the process, including deficient scar formation, excessive formation of repair components, and the formation of contractures. Firstly, inadequate formation of granulation tissue or the formation of a scar can lead to either dehiscence or ulceration. Dehiscence is the rupture of a wound, Excess mechanical stress, either from coughing or abdominal surgery, can actually cause this uh, wound to rupture. Ulceration can also occur if there is inadequate vascularization during healing, for example, in low extremity wounds in people with atherosclerotic vascular disease. Excessive formation of components of the repair process. These are things like hypertrophic scars or keloids. Excess collagen deposition can create a raised scar or a hypertrophic scar. And if the scar tissue grows beyond the borders of the original wound, this creates a keloid. Exuberant granulation is granulation tissue which protrudes above the level of the surrounding skin and blocks re-epithelialization. This must be removed by surgery to allow proper healing. And then finally, contraction of the wound site is an important part of the normal healing process. But if this is too severe, deforms the wound and surrounding tissue, it is termed contracture and can potentially compromise the movement of joints.